Thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon to explore the topic of RSEs, noise, and inadmissibility issues in Texas SIJS cases. The State Bar has approved this webinar for one hour of CLE credit. My name is Yasmin Yavar, and I'm presenting today with my colleague, Brandon Roche. We are both senior staff attorneys at the American Bar Association's Children's Immigration Law Academy, or CELA. Thanks, Yasmin. And uh, as she just said, my name is Brandon Roche. I wanted to remind everybody that if you have questions throughout this webinar, feel free to type them in the chat function on your screen. We'll do our best to address those questions during the course of the presentation if they uh, can be quickly addressed. And if not, we'll save them to the end and try to get to them. And we may need other, to answer others um, after the webinar, and we'll definitely get back to you by email if we don't have time today to answer your question. Yasmin is in Houston today, and I'm in beautiful Homestead, Florida. So if we sound like we're not in the same room, that's exactly why. Yasmin, take it away. Okay. Uh, let's get started. Here's a brief overview of what we will be covering. I'm going to start with the regulations and agency guidance that apply to RFEs and NOIDs. After that, I'll discuss how to respond to common RFEs and NOIDs. Finally, I'll review for you all some AAO decisions that might inform how you frame your responses or avoid them altogether. And then I'll turn it over to Brandon. Sure. After Yasmin um, tells us about RFEs and NOIDs, I'm going to address some common inadmissibility issues that arise in SIJS cases. And then I'll discuss the nuts and bolts of preparing and filing I-601 waivers. Okay, so let's start with the basics. An RFE is a request for evidence, and a NOID is a notice of intent to deny. Both are issued by USCIS in writing after receiving and considering an application for an immigration benefit. They flag one or sometimes more than one issue with the application and then provide you with an opportunity to respond by a set deadline. Sometimes the RFE or NOID is hand-delivered at an interview, but you might receive one before or after that, really any time before USCIS issues their decision. The regulations regarding RFEs and NOIDs can be found at 8 CFR 103.2, and they apply to applications for benefits generally, but we will be talking about their application to I-360s filed for special immigrant juvenile status today. RFEs generally come into play when there's a need for additional information, such as when all the required initial evidence is not submitted. NOIDs generally come into play when the initial evidence is all on file, but does not establish eligibility. The regulations are not exclusive as to when RFEs should be issued and when NOID should be issued, which is why I think each CIS office may vary in practice as to how they are utilized. In my experience, if you did not submit a birth certificate, you'll probably receive an RFE. If you submitted a post-18 order in certain parts of Texas, you've probably received a NOID. A NOID differs from an RFE in that with a NOID, there's been a preliminary decision to deny, and you're being given the opportunity to respond. There hasn't been that preliminary decision with an RFE. Okay, deadlines. Whether your application triggers an RFE or annoyed matters most when it comes to your deadline to respond. By regulation, you can only be given up to 12 weeks or 84 days to respond to an RFE. With noise, you can be given only up to 30 days. Per the regulations, additional time may not be granted, so it will not be granted. One note on deadlines is that you are not guaranteed the 84 or 30 days. The response time can be reduced on a case-by-case -case basis after obtaining supervisory concurrence. That's not something I've ever seen, but it is a possibility. My point, don't assume you've been given the maximum time. Always read your RFE or NOID carefully. Now you have three possible courses of action you can take upon receiving an RFE or NOID. You might respond completely, respond partially with what you're able to provide, or withdraw the benefit request altogether. A decision will be based on the record that USCIS has at the time your response is due. Remember that all requested materials must be submitted at one time, along with the original RFE or NOID. If you provide only some of the documents, maybe because you're still trying to get others, USCIS will consider that partial submission a request for a decision on the record that it has. Okay, 
Eligibility is determined at the time of filing. So per the provision of the regulations at 102.3b12, eligibility is going to be assessed at the time the benefit request is filed. Now, if you have a clerical error in your state court order, this provision would not necessarily apply. So let's say you have an order that actually incorrectly, incorrectly states your client's country of birth, but you've given USCIS a birth certificate with the correct country of birth. You might get an RFP regarding the discrepancy, and you might need to get a corrected order from your state court. But your client was eligible at the time of the application, at the time it was filed, so B12 should not be an issue. Okay, what happens if you don't respond? If you do not respond to the RFP you're annoyed by the stated deadline, your application may be denied either for abandonment, based on the record, or for both reasons. And there's the regulation for you. What's your recourse after a withdrawal or after abandonment? Well, you cannot appeal CIS's acknowledgement of a withdrawal or denial due to abandonment, but you can file a motion to reopen, and the relevant regulation is 103.5. You could also simply file a new benefit request, but it's going to require a new fee. Um, now that we're dealing with wait times on the 485s, you should know that you won't keep your first priority date if you do file a new benefit request. You should also know that although you are not automatically deemed for having withdrawn or abandoned a prior application, the facts and circumstances surrounding that prior request can be considered. Okay. The Adjudicator's Field Manual, for CIS, offers some interesting guidance for officers on RFEs. The guidance is found in Chapter 10.5, and per the manual, requesting additional evidence or returning a case for additional information may unnecessarily burden USCIS resources, duplicate other adjudication officers' efforts, and delayed case completion. In short, the manual discourages the use of RFEs. It says, in quote, if possible, it should be avoided. It also encourages officers to be resourceful in obtaining the information they want from sources other than the applicant, whether that be in other CIS records or from other external sources. And it indicates they should avoid phishing for evidence. Um, that last bullet says, in short, an adjudicator should strive to request the evidence needed for thorough, correct decision-making, but not fish for evidence. The field manual also offers some guidance on noise. A noise may be based on evidence of ineligibility or on derogatory information that USCIS has, but that the applicant and you as the applicant's lawyer are unaware of. The NOI provides the applicant the opportunity to review and rebut that derogatory information. I've put in the corresponding regulation here, and you can see that a determination as to statutory eligible eligibility should really be based on information disclosed to the applicant unless classified. But with discretion, a decision to exercise it favorably or unfavorably could be based in whole on classified information that's not in the record. And that's just something to be aware of. Now that we've seen the regulations and looked at the guidance that CIS officers look to in issuing RFUs and NOIDs, let's move on to discuss what you need to know to respond effectively. So why does CIS even issue RFUs and NOIDs? Well, they're authorized to do so by the regulations. Um, and, with, and that's for applications generally, right? Not just SIJS applications. But with SIJS specifically, there's the consent authority that's part of the statute at prong three. There's no specific standard set forth in the statute or current regulations regarding consent, but there is some legislative history that CIS often points to. This language really dates back to 1997, and the idea that USCIS will look at whether a request for SIJ classification is bona fide which means the state court order was sought for relief from abuse, neglect, abandonment, or a similar basis under state law, and not solely or primarily to obtain an immigration benefit. We often call this a primary purpose inquiry, and even um, if it is not specifically articulated in the RFE or NOID, it may very well be a concern of the USCIS officer. 
Okay, with that in mind, let's look at some common circumstances that may trigger RFEs and noise and what you might do in response. So you might get an RFE where there was no birth certificate or other proof of age submitted with the application. If that happens, you should look to the regulations concerning secondary evidence and affidavits at 8 CFR 103.2 B2. Um, if the birth was not registered or there's no birth certificate available, you could provide a record of no record from the consulate, and that's actually specifically contemplated in those regulations. Um, if the father is not listed on the birth certificate, but the juvenile court made findings um, concerning the father's abuse, abandonment, or neglect of the child, then you could provide further evidence of paternity that you presented to the state court, but that wasn't in your order. And you, that might come in the form of an acknowledgement in the waiver of citation, if there was a waiver, or other affidavits that maybe the court considered. If there are allegations of abuse, abandonment, neglect, or similar basis against a deceased parent or deceased parents, then something you could do is point to the record where the court recognized death as abandonment or equates death with a similar basis and cite the specific statutory provision or case law that supports that determination. If you have an order that was obtained after the child's 18th birthday, you should be aware of the district court case out of Austin um, and know that your decision from CIS may be held while that federal court considers the class action. Um, you could also identify the basis for the state court jurisdiction beyond the 18th birthday where possible if you are having to go ahead and respond to an RFE or NOID. Um, if there's an alleged conflict of SIJS facts with statements made to CBP, and that's something that CIS is inquiring about, you could argue against the use of the I-213 as unreliable, right? The I-213 is going to be that record of that interview with CBP, and we'll talk more about those later. And if CIS is indicating that they believe there's an insufficient factual basis for your order, you could provide evidence from the record in the state court proceeding that will show a reasonable factual basis, affidavits, testimony, um, whatever other evidence you submitted. Okay, many of the responses offered on the previous slide really allow CIS to look behind the state court order at many other documents in the state court file in order to question the primary purpose of the request for SIJ classification. As a matter of policy, some advocacy against this practice should be considered when responding to the RFE or noise. The ILRC has identified some helpful arguments that you might want to include in your response. I'll go over them quickly, but they're contained in the ILRC's advisory on RFEs and noise. So the primary purpose language is not in the statute or current regulations, and that's something to point out. On the regulations, we'll see what happens if they're issued in April of next year, which is what CIS is indicating. But I know that the proposed regulations that came out in 2011 did include some primary purpose language, so watch for that. Until the new regulations come out, though, we're safe on that argument. In addition, the primary purpose inquiry really ignores the reality that many of these children need protection from deportation to protect them from the abuse, abandonment, or neglect. So there's no primary reason the two really go hand in hand. You can also point to the way both the statute and regulations make clear that the determinations the state court is to make, that the state court is the one to make the determination, and that CIS should not second guess them. You can cite to the ombudsman's recommendations on point as well, and where the factual basis for your order is clear, indicate that further documentation is unnecessary. You've got it all in your order. Finally, in juvenile delinquency cases, you might be able to argue that providing records beyond the order violates Texas confidentiality law, and I've provided you with the relevant provisions from the Texas Family Code here. On the use of the I-213, right, the interview with CVP, there's a nice argument against use of the I-213 in the same ILRC advisory I referenced before explaining well their lack of reliability given the circumstances in which children are interviewed at the time of apprehension. But be aware of the recent CIS memo that was, um, it was issued on April 19, 2016 in response to the Ombudsman's recommendations. We're going to go over that in more detail in just a bit. 
Um, you can argue against the reliability of the I-213, but as a practical matter, if you have a client that remembers being interviewed by CBP and can actually tell you why there's a discrepancy, it might be a good idea to offer that explanation to CIS. So we've covered the regulations, agency guidance, and how to respond to RFEs and noise as a practical matter. Now I'd like to review just a few AAO decisions with you. None of these decisions are precedent decisions. In fact, as far as I'm aware, there aren't really precedent decisions on SIJS. But the decisions are helpful as they may inform how you frame your responses and even how you frame your state court action. This is by no means meant to be a comprehensive review of all the relevant decisions out there. There are many. The first decision I wanted to point out is this 2015 decision from Charlotte where USCIS denied based on a lack of a reasonable factual basis for the order and they relied on the child's interview with CBP. It involved the Texas order and the order had some broad language that the child had been subjected to parental abuse and or neglect and or abandonment as defined in the Texas Family Code. But the order didn't specify which, abuse, abandonment, neglect, or a combination. It also did not provide specific factual details upon which the best interest determination was made. Upon a de novo review of the record, the AO looked at the underlying petition for declaratory judgment, testimony and affidavits, and other evidence, including the father's death certificate. The director had relied on the child's I-213, which indicated subject claims her uncle lives in North Carolina and her parents live in Honduras. It listed the mother's name, but not the father's. In actuality, the child um, had been abandoned by and neglected by her mother, and her father was killed before she was born. Upon review, the AAO indicated, the record does not include a transcript of the interview or any other written statements by the interviewing officer or the petitioner to clarify the identities of the petitioner's parents. The narrative by itself does not diminish the value of the remaining evidence in the record which provides a reasonable factual basis for the court's findings. So that was a grant and is a, is a positive case to look to. This next decision, matter of AGMB, is a recent one out of Minnesota, but involves a Texas post-18 order in the form of a declaratory judgment. The AAO found that the petitioner did not meet her burden to show that the Texas court exercised jurisdiction over her as a minor and declared her dependent upon the court after her 18th birthday in accordance with Texas law. So the lesson from this one is to avoid references to the federal definition of juvenile and to look at state law for relevant definitions. Just one more case. This one also very recent, but from Missouri. I found this decision, matter of MECP, interesting and a bit troubling. It involved an order with language that mirrored the INA exactly and did not include specific factual findings to support the determination that the petitioner was abused, neglected, or abandoned. The court stated that the petitioner was neglected by his parents in Guatemala for failing to protect him from gang violence, exposing him to individuals who are violent, and that the child had been neglected and abandoned by his parents in that they allowed him to travel to a foreign country without proper care or custody. The AAO found the request for SIJ classification was not bona fide based on its review of the record and the fact that it did not indicate how the parents' various actions amounted to abuse, neglect, or abandonment. Here, the AAO really seemed to be looking for more than just a factual basis, but the court's actual analysis of how the parent's failure to protect or assist the petitioner amounted to neglect and abandonment. So that's one to be aware of. Okay, I mentioned before the April 19, 2016 response to the Ombudsman's recommendation on special immigrant juvenile adjudication that was prepared um, and made public by USCIS. In it, USCIS addressed the Ombudsman's request that USCIS give deference to state court orders and not revisit the factual findings. I wanted to point out some key sections from the memo that I think you should keep in mind as you draft your state court pleadings. Focus on state law is really the point of the first one. You see the underlying text indicates the order or orders should use language that establishes that the specific findings or rulings were made under state law and should not mirror or cite to immigration law and regulations. 
The juvenile court order may use different legal terms than those found in the INA as long as the findings have the same meaning as the requirements for SIJ classification. Make sure your order provides the factual basis for each finding is really the second point. And you see the underlying text indicates the juvenile court findings need not be overly detailed, but must reflect that the court made an informed decision for each of the required findings. On the note of avoiding RFEs and noise altogether, here's a quick tip sheet. First, start with how you present and prove up your state court proceedings. So be thinking ahead to a possible RFE and NOL or NOID from the very beginning. If you have a paternity issue, think about ways you can establish paternity for the court that will also satisfy CIS. If you have no birth certificate, get a record of no record early on, even if the state court does not require it. Avoid temporary orders, if at all possible. Take caution when utilizing over 18 declaratory judgments. So we know about the district court action out of Austin, but that case seems to contemplate really um, cases in which there were child support orders, not declaratory actions. So we're not sure how that case um, will impact, if at all, post-18 declaratory judgments, and we are seeing denials by CAS on those in many jurisdictions in Texas. Include a brief statement of the facts supporting each of the SIJS findings in the order. And finally, look at state law. Demonstrate the valid basis under Texas law for the state court action. Rather than relying on the INA definition of juvenile, for example, look to how Texas law defines child. If your same jurisdiction extends past the 18th birthday, how under Texas law? If they're saying death is abandonment or a similar basis, how under Texas law? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon for now. Okay. Thank you much. Um, and once again, happy Friday afternoon, everyone. Go ahead and stand up at your desk, stretch a little bit. I know it's uh, late in the day and probably been a long week, so. Um, we're going to go into inadmissibility issues and preparing the waiver packet, as you can see here on our outline of, of the webinar. So what I want to start with um, first is just kind of a quick definition of inadmissibility. And not really a definition so much as a, a real easy kind of to understand layman's terms um, way of putting it. Laurel Scott in a CLE from 2014 described it quite well in saying that a ground of inadmissibility is something about the alien or the alien's history, usually a prior immigration violation or criminal conviction, that makes it so the person is not allowed to enter the United States. Congress has determined that if a person would not be allowed to enter the, in, enter the country if he were outside the U.S., that person cannot adjust status to that of a permanent resident from within the U.S. And that's a really easy way of kind of understanding, um, you know, what we're talking about in the really big picture. So um, to distinguish between that and, sorry, my, my slides are not advancing here. Yasmin, can you advance that slide? Yasmin? Sorry, I think we've uh, lost something here. I think there's a slight delay, but, are, but um, are we on the right one now? It should be the inadmissibility and deportability uh, slide. That's where we are. Okay, great. Um, go ahead and keep advancing from now on because I think uh, I'm, I'm not seeing that exact slide, but I'll keep going. So inadmissibility comes from INA 212 and deportability comes from INA 237. Preliminarily, preliminarily, just to distinguish, inadmissibility is basically you can't come in. Deportability is that you've already been allowed in, but now you need to leave. So think of it like a giant bar. Inadmissibility is governed by the bouncer at the door, whether you meet the dress code, whether you're too drunk to come in, etc. Deportability are those rules that will get you kicked out once you're inside, fighting, passing out, whatever it might be. So where it gets complicated is when someone is already here, in the case of SAJS grantees, but they're seeking to adjust status and the rules of inadmissibility apply because they're adjusting from establishing this immigrant visa eligibility to their legal permanent residency. And we can go to that next slide, please. Oh, 
Okay, so INA 245H, and um, really basic, really quickly, SIJ has special rules regarding which grounds of inadmissibility apply, which are waivable and which are not. These are laid out here in INA 245H. Um, specifically, 245H governs adjustment of status just for SIJ grantees, so it does not affect one's ability to apply for SIJS. That is to say, it's an issue at adjustment and not an issue that would preclude anyone from getting SIJS granted in the first place. I want to point out that the statute makes certain things inapplicable to SIJ grantees, certain things are waivable at the discretion of the adjudicator, and certain things are a bar to adjustment. The discretion comes from the May wording um, that you see there in about five lines down um, in italics and underlined. And so that discretion uh, is given to the adjudicator for certain types of inadmissibility issues. Further, the statute lays out exactly what reasons are necessary. So the adjudicator must find that it is for humanitarian purposes, family unity, or when it is otherwise in the public interest. Notably, you do not need to show extreme hardship for a waiver under INA 245H. So that's often um, you know, thought of as a general type of inadmissibility, but it does not apply to um, admissibility here for SIJS kids. And with that, we'll go to what exactly are the breakdown of um, what doesn't apply, what's waivable, and what's not waivable. Okay, and um, so on this next slide, you can see that um, certain things no waivers are necessary for. So the CDPRA in 2008 at Section 235D3 expanded these particular exemptions when it was enacted. These are things that you won't have to file an I-601 for. In reality, how likely are you to see some of these things in your typical cases? Um, public charge is something that you would ideally have stricken from the NCA at pleadings if it was on there at all. Uh, the misrepresentation is probably something you might see. Um, it usually plays out in the child being given a false birth certificate, told to present it to officials when they're picked up. The kid just does what they're told, and officials usually realize pretty quickly that it's fake, but they have an unaccompanied minor on their hands at that point. This might be something more likely seen at a checkpoint in the valley, someone trying to get further north after avoiding apprehension. Um, just to clarify, working without authorization is exempted elsewhere in the INA at 245C. It's not one of these grounds of inadmissibility here, so it doesn't fall under the labor cert that you see there or under misrepresentation in general. And then you also see at the bottom um, 212A9B, unlawful presence is uh, accepted there from an inadmissibility ground. So on the next slide, we have the ground of inadmissibility that are waivable. There are many accepted grounds for SIJS grantees, but in reality, only a few are going to come up. I don't think anyone's really going to be filing one for the unqualified physician inadmissibility ground uh, for an unaccompanied minor. I, I seriously I doubt it. Um, some of the ones that might come up, I bolded here, and you can see health-related grounds. So the health-related grounds that are waivable, if they exist, are communicable diseases of public health significance. And they actually have a list of specifically which diseases those are. Amongst them, it's things like gonorrhea, leprosy, syphilis, tuberculosis is a big one. You'll see on the I-601 that there are two extra pages um, specifically regarding tuberculosis, if that's the case there. Uh, notably, HIV and AIDS is not one of the grounds of public health significance that is um, inadmissible, that would make someone inadmissible. And mental health is another one. So the way the law is, is worded there, or the inadmissibility ground is worded, physical or mental disorders and a history of behavior associated with the disorder, which behavior has posed a threat to the property, safety, or welfare of the alien or others and is likely to recur. So if you have a you know, client with a serious history of mental health issues, um, depending on what has happened and kind of the background in general, it may require a waiver. Um, it's probably something that you would get RFE'd on at the interview if they were, um, you know, 
if the interviewer decided that those grounds reached uh, the circumstances that reached that ground. Other things to look for that you might see in an unaccompanied minor would be failure to attend removal proceedings. That applies really, however, to those seeking admission after departure or removal. So this is not really your general case for um, your SIG kids that got an in absentia order and then got a motion to reopen granted in order to go through the process. So this is someone who um, didn't attend and then actually left the country um, or was removed from the country after that in absentia order was issued. Uh, smuggling, and that applies to both drugs and people. And I highlight this here because later I want to discuss a hypo on how a waiver might play out in that situation. Um, and then finally, uh, Children with multiple entries might fall under 212A9C there at the bottom, uh, aliens unlawfully present after previous immigration violations. And so this is something that even if you're not trying to count time for unlawful presence in general, you still need to look if they've been in any, uh, had any prior entries and look at the aggregate time from those previous entries. If it's more than one year, it may require a waiver under this um, clause. Okay, so on the next slide, following along, we have those grounds that are not waivable, um, and these are going to be criminal grounds for the most part, as you can see there. And with SIJF recipients, we're primarily focused on the first three items here: the INA 212A2 classifications. So, with what I'll call the lead adjustment, or the idea that with the 485s not being available um, and EB4 visa specifically not being available for SIJS grantees right now, we have a lot more clients who will be over 18 um, once they go to adjust and still have had to wait longer before having a visa available. And that's also going to make them more likely to have had time to get convicted of something, unfortunately. Um, we're dealing with teenagers. Teenagers do. Um, don't think sometimes. So it's going to happen. And I want to point out those certain crimes there. I've got the asterisks up there. Um, these are crimes involving moral turpitude, CIMT, as you'll often see it abbreviated, and also a violation of any law relating to a controlled substance. And first off, what's a crime of moral turpitude? Uh, you're always going to want to do this CIMT analysis if there's any kind of um, conviction or really any run-in with the law, any charges that uh, your client may accrue. And it's very fact-specific. You're going to have to look at the state law classifications and current case law on CIMT, but generally speaking, what you're looking for are any kind of conviction for intent to commit fraud, and that can be felonies or misdemeanors, intent to commit theft, um, intent to cause or threaten great bodily harm, and that also includes the mens rea of recklessness. So it doesn't have to be, you know, um, actual, uh, well, the intent would go to that. So you can have recklessness. And offenses with malice as an element or sex offenses with lewd as an element. And there is a petty offense exception. I'm going to um, touch on that in a moment. So we'll talk about that. But for the most part, you just want to keep these things in mind when you're looking at any kind of uh, court or conviction record that your client might have, and you're going to want to look up the state law and see how they're classified, and then at least know that you know CIMTs are out there and you need to at least look it up. So the other piece I want to touch on here is what matters isn't so much that there was a conviction, because the statute at INA 212A2AI makes it such that any alien convicted of or who admits having committed or who admits committing acts which constitute the essential elements of one of these types of crimes. And that's really where it comes into play, your 485, where the question about have they ever done anything for which they were not arrested, right? And so that would get at potentially them being forced to admit in an interview the essential elements of one of these crimes. So keep that in mind as you're going through. And on this next slide, um, once again, touching on the convictions, as some of you know, juvenile convictions essentially don't count. So there's two important caveats, really, to the convicted um, piece of that. First, 
the really uh, there's really clear case law, as is stated up there in the first box at the top, that juvenile delinquency uh, is not considered a conviction for immigration purposes. So while the law here says conviction, it's not always that straightforward. It's not like you can just tell the officer, oh, they were a juvenile, don't worry about that. They're probably still going to RFE you, and you're going to have to show um, through court records if you can't provide them or through evidence that the court records are sealed. Um, and that it was indeed a juvenile conviction, that there is no adult conviction on the record making this um, rule of inadmissibility come into play here. And that might include you know, submitting whatever records are available, as I said, um, but it also might include, you know, you're going to have to show things like a, a, um, evidence of no record, or like I said, evidence of having the entire proceeding sealed and show that you can't turn over that information to them. Um, second, the petty offense exception is listed here. And although it's hard to conceive of a crime of moral turpitude, like I just went through that list, involving anything that's truly petty, you're always going to want to look at the sentencing range for any offense because a one-time crime involving moral turpitude might fall within this exception. So really what you're looking for, of course, is is it just one time? Is there only one thing on this child's record? And then you can see you're going to want to look at the state sentencing um, guidelines and the statutes for whether or not the maximum possible sentence for that charge was one year and the actual sentence given was less than six months, right? So not sentenced to more than six months. And it doesn't matter if your child was sentenced to eight months and only served four, the actual um, petty offense exception counts what they were sentenced to. So that has to be less than six months. Okay, on the next slide here, we uh, have a picture of Willie, and it's, um, I was gonna use Snoop Dogg, but since it's Texas, I figured Willie might be more appropriate. And this is that random ground whereby one um, can be accepted from the one-time conviction of so much of such paragraph as relates to a single offense of simple possession of 30 grams or less of marijuana. And don't worry, I Googled it so that you don't have to. 30 grams is a pretty decent amount of marijuana. 28 grams is an ounce, and both Washington State and Colorado's laws allow for possession of up to one ounce. So more than that, you'd be out of compliance, even in Washington and Colorado, certainly in Texas. Um, but that is um, a decent amount. So of course, if your uh, client has anything to do with drugs, you want to immediately get the record, find out what drugs they were charged with possessing, and the amount. And that's probably going to be in the arrest record more than in the actual court record because um, it has to do with then what charges might come down. And it might not say an actual weight there, but the arrest record probably will. Um, on that same note, the law does say related to. So if you have a charge uh, or a conviction for something like uh, paraphernalia, possession of paraphernalia, that actually would be would fall under that related to the possession um, language there. So keep that in mind, and if you see anything along those lines, just know that there's um, information out there and there's case law out there on those points. Okay, so we've gone through inadmissibility issues, and I'm going to move into now um, the preparing of the waiver packets here and just go through some actual very you know practical tips um, of preparing an I-601 waiver if you do decide that it's necessary in your case. So first off, as you see here, we've got the, um, you know, the stage is going to be gathering evidence. You want to know what's required based on whether or not you have an RFE or based on whether or not you're just having to submit this affirmatively. And then I'm going to touch on um, preparing the actual waiver and finally where and how to file it. So the I-601 instructions, um, which are actually here, inserted here in that first top box, um, lay out kind of what you're going to be asked to provide. And those things are affidavits, of course. Um, you're going to be asked to provide medical records, uh, anything really that they can use to try and 
um, decide whether or not your grounds fall within that case. So police reports, court records, of course, as I already mentioned, and that includes also maybe um, arrest, um, arrest records or a record of no record. Um, yeah, I've been touched on that earlier, and that's a different thing she was talking about, but I'm talking about going to, like, your local, in, in Houston, for example, have the Harris County Sheriff's Department um, issue, a, you know, when you ask them for your arrest record, they can actually issue a page that just says this person has never been arrested in Harris County, something like that, or this person has no record in Harris County. You get that, you get a certified copy of it, and that's what you would submit. Um, if applicable, any evidence of rehabilitation and any evidence... There's that one there, number five, anything you want to submit that their admission would not be against the national welfare, public safety, national security, I doubt that's really going to be terribly relevant for unaccompanied minors. It may be. But, um, and so really what are, the, um, what are the factors that the officer is going to look for when adjudicating an I-601? It is discretionary, as you see there. It's your job to show that it is warranted as a matter of discretion, and the officer is going to weigh the favorable factors um, with the favorable factors outweighing the unfavorable. So when I say line up the equities, it's really those same things that we mentioned that they're going to specifically ask for and that the I-601 instructions call for, but, you know, you really want to try to think as broadly as possible, too. So you can even get affidavit attesting to the character of your client, maybe not just about the particular incident in question, but if they've got a pastor that they work with at Sunday school or a favorite teacher, anybody that's willing to say something favorable obviously would go a long way here. Evidence of rehab, and so that's not just maybe court-mandated um, court rehab uh, or drug rehab, but it also could be something along the lines of um, just showing the judge, or in this case the adjudicator, uh, that you know, your client has, has really turned the life around, something else has happened, and, and they've, you know, they're no longer um, in any kind of trouble. So rehab could be evidence of them completing a certain after-school program, or maybe they've joined the Boy Scouts and got their new merit badge. I don't know. That's a stretch. I know that you're all smiling right now for something like that. But um, evidence of any other programs completed, grades and school awards, of course, always are good to throw in there. And any community involvement. Are they playing on the soccer team? Are they, you know, in an after school program? Whatever you can find, throw it in there. It certainly can't hurt, right? Okay. So, with that, um, this next slide here talks about and shows you the actual excerpts from an I 601. And really, the two points that are most relevant for an SIJ um, applicant for an I-601 are going to be the Section B, Question 19 here. So all the other sections actually lay out individually which ground of inadmissibility you're applying for and ask you to check the box there. When it comes to SIJ and T visa grantees as well, um, you actually have to write out which ground applies to you. So in that sense, I would recommend that you just take the language from the other portion there. I mean, why try to reword it when you can use their own wording from an inadmissibility ground that's already listed in the very same form and just stick it in there verbatim so that they won't get confused. There's no you know, way to mis misconstrue what you're applying for. Now, on the right side there, you have the inadmissibility statement, and that's really the meat of your case, right? And this is where you're going to tell the officer or judge, the adjudicator, um, What's happened? You know, you're going to lay out your entire timeline. You're going to lay out what happened, why, why it falls in those grounds, why that for humanitarian, family unity, or public interest, it's you know worthy of a, a waiver, and um, you know really make your case. So they've actually got in the in the form, kind of the whole right side of the page is listed as if you were going to write it out by hand or something. Obviously, I, um, I would recommend writing that out in a separate letter and then just noting it here like it says. Although there's a discrepancy in the actual form, it says to note at number 39 that you're attaching a letter when, as you see at the start of that same box, um, you're actually writing this at item number 40. It probably doesn't matter. They'll probably get it either way. Um, you might want to just write in both, I'm attaching a letter, just so they can't possibly send it back to you and, and reject the file. And, um, little things like that sometimes will, as you all know, 
really mess with USCIS. So with that said, um, um, I do want to talk about, you know, I mentioned whether you're filing with a judge or with USCIS. So there are some circumstances whereby you might be filing your I-601 in court, um, possibly due to something on the I-213. And if the IJ or the TA know that a waiver will be necessary, then they're probably going to refuse to terminate because um, they would want to, of course, the TA would, and the judge is probably going to go along with the idea that they'd want to adjudicate that in court, the entire adjustment. Um, this is also somewhat moot because given that there are no visas currently available, there's no terminations anyways. So you're either going to be asking for continuances, um, uh, well, regardless, you're probably going to be asking for continuances until we um, get to a different point in that process. But you know, you can ask the TA, of course, as always, for a joint motion to terminate or non-opposition. Like I said, it's probably only when there's something on the IT to the team would they even have an idea that there might be a waiver necessary, and then want to um, you know adjust in court. So if it's something outside of that, you're probably better off going through USCIS. Okay, um, logistics, and there are two ways to go about it, of course. You can file with USCIS, or you can file um, probably against your will, but be forced to do this process in court with EOIR. Uh, if you are filing a fee waiver, of course, that's the I-912. If not, the form, the I-601, usually is $585 is the cost. Um, but the big factor with doing it in court, of course, is seeing in your application. So just looking at the right side there, you would do your filing as normal. It's going to go through the Chicago lockbox. You can file it you know, alongside the 485. You can file it before, um, well, if it's before the filing of the I-45, you'd file it all, all together, really. And you might even wait until the kind of um, cases come to some sort of fruition and there's some kind of resolution at the end before filing anything. And if the violation happens after you filed your 485, you can offer it affirmatively, as in you can walk into the interview and tell the officer, I've already filed this, here's a copy. Um, or you can wait, and the officer is probably going to send you an RFE or give, it, give you an RFE in the interview if the terms come up under which an admissibility may apply. Um, with EOIR, you file it, and then you take a copy of that filing along with your receipt for having paid the fee or your fee waiver, and then file that with the, the court. And that's what they're going to want to see in order to then go through the court process. Okay, so I have a few examples here. And um, just go through them really quickly. We have just a few minutes left. Um, what would happen, an unaccompanied child wins SIJS, gets an approved I-360, you have to wait until the visa numbers are current in order to file your 485. So in the interim, your client is caught driving without a license and has a small amount of marijuana in the car. In addition to the license violation, he's charged with possession of marijuana. It's the client's first offense, and he accepts probation and community service. He then comes to you to tell you this has happened. So what do you do? Well, of course, first off, you establish a timeline of events. When did this happen? Um, you know, how old were you? Were you 17, 18? Um, and you want to know the terms they've been given. Uh, ideally, they would come to you before pleading to anything, but maybe not. Maybe they've already actually pled, and you don't have any say in that matter. Um, so you immediately want to find out, you know, what are the terms of your probation? Have you completed it? Uh, and if not, when might you complete all of those terms? What documentation does the client have? They're often going to have you know, probably random pages from the court record, maybe the actual ticket they received when they were arrested on the given night or the citation, if it was that. Um, but you're going to then have to go searching for kind of fuller documentation. And that includes getting copies from the court. Uh, most RFEs and the I-601 in general is going to require you to have certified court copies, certified records. Um, you're going to want an arrest record from the arresting agency whether that's the local police department or you know, the sheriff's office. Um, and so a lot of times you know, these are things you can send the client to get. You can ask your client, you know, this is what I need. You can maybe write it down, give them a letter. 
tell them to take that to you know the sheriff's office and get those documents and bring them back to you, those kinds of things. Um, and there are courts in Texas that are not courts of record. So um, some of the very small municipal courts and stuff will just tell you, we don't do certified copies. Um, they can give you records, but they're not going to be certified. And that's something I've just had to explain in my cover letter or in my letter of admissibility, um, stating you know, this is all that this particular court can offer. So um, that's kind of just how you would think through one of those issues there with what's going on. Um, I have some sample language here. And um, this really is just kind of a, a really quick starter template for how you might lay out the very basics of a charge like that in the example there. Um, and I just put it in the slide so that you can refer back to it if you, if you really want to go through it. We don't have to spend much time on it now. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead and go on to example two. And so here at example two, um, an unaccompanied child from Mexico tells you at the initial interview that he has multiple prior entries. Each time he previously entered, he'd be sent back the next day by CBP. This time, he was sent into a shelter and eventually released to an aunt. He seems to qualify for SIJF, but you suspect his I-213 will have allegations, allegations of him having acted as a coyote. Can you proceed with SIJ? Is the potential smuggling a waivable offense? So as you see there, the first bullet point, you know, these inadmissibility issues don't have anything to do with whether or not you can proceed with SIJ. Yes, you can. You want to look for 212A9C violations. He says he's been in and out several times. Um, does he have that one-year aggregate time that might uh, require a waiver under 212A9C for multiple prior entries? Um, the actual smuggling uh, looks like, you know, having acted like coyote probably is on the I-213, especially if, of course, he'd been picked up by CBT and sent back the next day. They would have put that in the record. Um, so, you know, it's waivable, but be prepared for the TA to object to termination and be prepared to adjust and file your 601 waiver in court at that point. And we already went over kind of how to do so, how to file in court. Um, this is one where you're really going to have to line up the equities, obviously, and, and explain why, even though he had those multiple prior attempts to come in and, and went back and seemed to be making money based on it, um, that this child deserves it for one of the reasons we, we cited earlier. Um, so with that said, I want to leave time for questions. So we'll go real quick just on the recap. Um, this is our outline slide here. We covered the federal regs and agency manual on RFE noise, RFEs and NOIDs. We gave you some tips and legal arguments that will hopefully prove helpful in responding to those. And we pointed out some relevant AAO decisions we also discussed in an invisibility issues and gave you some pointers on preparing the waiver packet should you need to. We here at SELA, of course, are always available for uh, any further follow-up and any more specific technical assistance that we can help you with um, on any of this stuff. So, Yasmin. Okay. Um, we included this last slide just to offer you some sense of what happens if and when an application is ultimately denied. With the I-360, appellate jurisdiction lies with the AAO. If you had the I-45 or I-601 decided by an immigration judge, then appellate jurisdiction there will lie with the BIA, otherwise with the AAO as well. When the denial was by USCIS, you would utilize Form I-290 to file the appeal, motion to reopen or motion to reconsider, and there is a fee of $630, but it can be waived. Um, interestingly, Per the regulations, the official who made the unfavorable decision being appealed shall review the appeal unless the affected party moves to a new jurisdiction. And within 45 days of receipt of the appeal, the reviewing official may treat the appeal as a motion to reopen or reconsider and take favorable action. Otherwise, he or she is going to go ahead and forward the appeal on to the AAO. Yeah, and remember that you can always refile as opposed to appealing, and that may be your only option if you've missed the deadlines for appealing. Typically, those are 30 or 33 days, so there's, there's no limit on how many times you can file uh, a waiver, even based on the same grounds. doesn't mean that it's going to have any better chance of getting approved the second time around, however. 
And um, this last one on, on helpful resources, we wanted to conclude with some, all of which we relied upon in putting together this webinar. They include some ILRC resources and links to the USGIS Adjudicator's Field Manual and response to the USGIS Ombudsman's recommendations that um, was recently made by USGIS. Okay. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, there is a little bit of time for questions. Again, you can put them in the chat box. Um, and I hope you found the presentation to be helpful. If you have technical assistance requests, as I said, please feel free to reach out to us. Call, email, drop by our office. We're available for staff attorneys and pro bono attorneys on any issue related to children's immigration work. Um, and just to note, our next training will be a live day-long training on July 15th here at South Texas College of Law, recently renamed the Houston College of Law. It will focus on preparing and presenting an asylum case, trial advocacy in the family courts, sorry, and mindful lawyering. We have sent out the information through Vera and our listeners on how to register, so please look out for that. And at this point, okay. we can take a few, a few questions. Um, we did have one question from Jay that I'm not sure you all saw in the chat box, and it was just where do you get this record of no record that I was talking about. That's going to come from the consulate. Um, and um, if you need um, contact for the consulate, I, I think sometimes the consulate officers, the consular officers in D.C. are more helpful. Um, and if you need some contacts, if you need a specific um, record of no record from um, one of the Northern Triangle countries, just let us know, and we can get you that contact information. Um, and the only other question I think we got was whether or not the PowerPoint would be available. It will. We'll send it to all of you that participated next week. Um, we'll also apply for your CLE credit with the State Bar. We have your bar numbers, hopefully. Um, if you registered through ReadyTalk. And then the recording is going to be available um, through Vera and the ABA. Um, you can, um, if you have colleagues that want to watch it later, it will be uh, available for CLE credit. Um, so we'll, we'll send out information um, once those are posted. Um, so thanks to everyone for um, participating, and we wish you all a great weekend. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Stop recording. Thank you. Bye-bye.